Welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. In every episode, I interview someone who's changed, recovered, or become successful after having faced real adversity in their life. What's more, at the end of every episode, guests give you a few bits of advice which you can use to improve your own life too. On today's episode is successful shoeshine entrepreneur Drew Goodall, who became homeless after his acting career fell apart due to a lack of confidence. He had gone from appearing in films alongside marquee names like Brad Pitt and Hugh Grant to living on the streets and hitting rock bottom. After around seven months of homelessness, Drew stumbled upon the idea of shining shoes in London offices as a way to make money. And he's since turned this into a really successful business, which serves some of the biggest companies in the UK. Drew also made the incredible decision to only employ people that were either homeless as well, have special needs, or are disadvantaged in some way. So not only is he a successful entrepreneur, but he's doing real good in society as well. So without further ado, let's find out what happened by listening to his story from start to finish. Before we get into um, Sunshine and, and the business that you're that you're running now, Drew, I'd like to rewind to somewhere near the start. And the thing that I found amazing about your story is that before you actually uh, ended up becoming homeless, you were you were working as an actor alongside some some marquee names in the in the form of Brad Pitt um, and Hugh Grant. If you could just tell us a little bit about your your acting career before yeah before you obviously uh, found yourself in a situation of, of homelessness. The first thing to say about it is, and probably one of the principal reasons why everything went south for me, was that I trained to be an actor from a fairly young age. And when you train to be an actor, really, and your hopes and dreams of being of being an actor, um, everything else sort of gets pushed to the side. You don't. I never really had. I didn't have any other skills. I, I, you know, schooling and all that sort of stuff was forget about it. And um, and then more importantly, I didn't want to do anything else. You know, that that was my thing. I wanted to be an actor. That was how it was going to be. Why bother doing? You know, why bother getting any skills or any? Uh, because I'm being an actor. Yeah. So um, that's that's the sort of genesis of where I was mentally at that time in life and I then proceeded through my local at my local college and acted there and it turned out I was good, good at it and then I went on to London and then I, I did drama school and etc so I went the whole system I went through the whole system from top to bottom and by the time I graduated I was what people would probably describe as quite old um, and I sort of, I launched into my career, and as you say, I, I did I did some I did some good roles. Uh, did in Snatch with um, Brad Pitt, which is the one that's really got the uh, the media's juices flowing. Um, uh, and I uh, also did a, a bit part with Hugh Grant in About a Boy. I also did uh, a, a, a thing with Ray Winston well which hasn't got much publicity but I, I did do that um so I, I did a number of things and i felt that even though the roles were tiny and i did lots of big roles but they were in lesser known things you know more in theatrical sense uh i believed to all in sense of purposes that this was the way for me you know and there was no reason to expect anything different i'd I'd um, I got to that level, and I was in something that had Hollywood stars in it, even if it was very small. Uh, but the warning signs were there for me. Looking back now, with hindsight, and what were those warning signs, Drew? Well, the warning signs were really uh, uh, the warning signs. Really, were a sort of sense of confidence. Uh, I was kind of very much my confidence could fluctuate vastly between. Um, it can, it can fluctuate vastly between being extremely upbeat, thinking, my God, I'm in something with Ray Winston, or oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah. you know, I'm here, I'm champion of the world, you know, <laughs> but way beyond anything, you know, way beyond anything rational. 
uh, and then I, I the, the slightest criticism, and I would just fall through the floor, you know. And, be, and it wouldn't even have to be a direct criticism; it could be just an inferred something, some inference of a criticism. And I, I would just go through the floor, and I would be devastated by it, and, and start questioning what I was doing, and you know those things. But I, I sort of pushed them to one side uh, in the. Uh, which I think most of us do. Um, I push them to one side because I, I, well, I, I, I told myself, you know, that, okay, you know, in the bigger picture, I am a good actor, you know. But there was a point; it became a tipping point where my doubts then uh, transferred. Rather than just being doubts, it sort of turned more into a reality in my mind that, okay, I'm suddenly this, I'm not up to this. Uh, I'm not good enough, basically. Sure. And at what age then did you decide to to stop acting as a result of these confidence issues that, that you've mentioned? I was um, at 26. About 26, yeah. Sure. And then, so h- how long after you stopped acting did you find yourself with with nowhere to stay, essentially? Was there quite a long period after you stopped or was it quite soon you, you stopped acting and then you found yourself being homeless? Yeah, I was, I was, in, a cur- I was in a curious position, really, because um, I kind of, you know, I did this thing. I, 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 did, a, I did a show and it was a, on the the- in the theatre and that was the show that really sent me off the rails because I got reviewed really badly. And um, that really sort of sent me off the rails. And I, um, and I kind of, I felt that I can't do this anymore. But uh, I didn't really know what to do. And I, I didn't feel like, and so I, I knew that I didn't want to do it anymore, but I'd kind of been institutionalized into the way of acting, you know, it's like a cult. Is almost it? I've been brainwashed. Yeah. I mean, I brainwashed myself, you know. I brainwashed myself into, it. and then, and then. So you imagine someone coming out of a cult, and then they're just going, "Right, this is. There's no structure here. I'm not wearing long robes and sort of, you know, running around chanting anymore. What do I do? This is a different world to the one I know, uh, and and." And you sort of feel safer in the other world, you know, you feel safer in the world where there's a very clear progression. You, you got auditions, you, you, you know, you moved on. And I, I wasn't ready to stop believing, but I was. You know, there was this kind of, this dual thing at play. And for, for various reasons at the time, it became apparent that... Um, uh, I, I, because I wasn't acting anymore, I was unable to pay the rent any longer. Yeah. Because I wasn't earning any money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't really have any um, enthusiasm or motivation or anything to do any other job or any skills to do any other job. Uh, so I kind of just let it slide, purposefully let it slide. Uh, I guess I was feeling sorry for myself. It's put it in an unflattering way. I was feeling sorry for myself. And I, I think anyone who's experienced anything in that in their life can speak to that the, there is a sense that when, when you fall down, that part of the reason why you fall down is because you want to fall down. Yeah, yeah. This kind of you self-deprecation. Know, you, yeah, you kind of want... You know when you have a love, like a girl or a boy or whatever, and you break up, but you're still in love with her or him and you, you, you know it's over, but you don't want to, you want to feel sorry for yourself. You want to mope and you want to sit there and you want to feel sorry for yourself. Yeah. 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 And that was how, where I was at. And I, as far as I was concerned, the fact that I didn't make it and, uh, and I couldn't make my parents proud and everything else, it, it meant that, I felt like I, I, I didn't want, I felt I deserved it. 
Yeah, in in some kind of weird way, you do kind of want to feel the pain in those in those scenarios. And the the example you gave about someone breaking up with you is a great example of that. You know, because you sit in your room and you put cold play on or whatever it may be, and you exacerbate that pain in some way. Personal choice there, yeah, personal choice. But um, but yeah, I can I can certainly understand that. I can certainly understand that. And it sounds that things just you know went gradually downhill from there. Could could you talk us through your first night? living on the streets do you remember that moment when you be- first became um i guess homeless and what what was going through your mind at that stage because <clears throat> i imagine it's an incredibly daunting experience well my experiences of it were rather unusual um there's, there's quite a story attached to it but uh to try and cl- yeah, uh, try and cut it down a little um i wh- I, I was kicked out of my uh, bed sit who i was sharing with a fellow actor uh, he went off and lived with his girlfriend. And I um, I managed to get a, a friend to put me up. So I was technically homeless then, but I had a I was sleeping on his sofa and that was all good. Um, but my first real night of homelessness um, it was very strange. But I was sleeping in a a, a chilling a food chilling cabinet. Wow. Yeah. I felt, and I, I was sleeping in a food chilling cabinet in, in a Domino's Pizza. Yeah, because when I, when I was an actor, I had um, I had a part time job, uh, earned me like thirty five quid a week, and um, I figured out that uh, I'd figured out that you know I, I could possibly if I if I left the window open, I could sneak in overnight and sleep in there. And the only real place that I could sleep with any with any uh, uh, way of not being caught was inside this, this huge metallic food chilling cabinet, and I slept in that for the uh, best part of uh, two two weeks. I slept in there, and I had to uh, put on all the. They had delivery drivers and I had to put on all the delivery drivers' thermals because it was cold. So it's cold. So I had to put I put on all their uh, you know, all their clothes that they used to deliver pizzas with on the motorbikes. And uh, I slept in there, but it wasn't a good sleep because I was always worried I'd be caught all the time. And I was caught in the end. Wow. What's what's going through your mind when you find yourself sleeping in in a place like that? Are you thinking of any way to get yourself out of the situation, or is it just pure sort of instinct of survival? What's what's going through your, your how is yeah? What is your mindset like then? Well, I, I certainly wasn't thinking about pulling myself out of it. As far as I was concerned, I deserved what I'd done. I deserved it because of my failure. I deserved it uh, because. I didn't, I didn't want to pull myself out of it. I'd let down everyone. I'd let down my parents. I'd let down my friends. And most of all, I'd let down myself. And um, I, so I, I, didn't, I didn't want to. So obviously, it, it, it was kind of like being in prison. Like they talk about being in prison and, and you're your first night in prison. And, you know, to your point about the first night, being homeless. They say the the first night in prison is the worst. It was pretty much the worst for me. Uh, I did feel exiled from the world. I mean, I was in a I was in a huge metallic chilling cabinet, surrounded by random bits of food and pepperoni and stuff like that. And I I, I didn't know why. I didn't understand what was going on in my mind. I didn't understand why I'd done this to myself. Um, I didn't really understand anything, um, and it, it, in retrospect, I guess it was all part of the uh, was all part of the um, grieving process. What's your day to day life like when when you were homeless? What did you do to pass the time? How did you you know find stuff? How did you sustain yourself? Really, finding food and stuff to eat and all, all the rest of it. Well, initially. Before I was caught sleeping in the, in the chilling cabinet, I, I did have this 
part-time job that paid me 30 quid a week, uh, which is obviously not enough to find somewhere to live, 30 pounds a week. So I had a little bit of money, uh, and, and so that was kind of okay. Um, but then they found out what I was doing, and I got sacked, and so I didn't have that money. Uh, what did I do? Um, you get a lot of time to consider life. Um, I, I never really, I, I've never been into drugs, so that that's saved me in a lot of ways. I was never into drugs, and I've never I've never drunk alcohol in my life. Uh, so that kind of saved me in that sense because a lot of people, you know, they fall into the trap trap of alcohol abuse and substance abuse, uh, that sort of stuff. And that kind of, that whiles away a lot of the time for a lot of the people I met yeah. when I was on the street. But the, I never had that. So in that sense, that sort of gave me even more time. Um, and I spent a lot of a lot of time sitting up, just sitting outside the tube station. Um, if it was particularly cold, I, I would go around and walk around the shops you know, walk around like this. This is the this was the latter half of the nineties, early early two thousands, and you had things like um, um, uh, uh, cash converters and these sorts of places. There were pawn shops actively, and um, I used to walk around them and I used to look at the different things, and, um, keep warm, and chat to the, some of the friendly staff and stuff like that. Um, and I, I kind of created, uh, when I got homeless, I found that the first weeks or so were, were just awful because you, you were completely lost. And then slowly I, I started to get, uh, it's, you know, it's like in lockdown, you know how the first few weeks of lockdown, we we're all like, oh God, what are we going to do? Let's do things around the house. And then you do things around the house and then you're like, oh, you know, it's only so long you can do that. Yeah. And you're like, what do I do? I've got nothing to do. But then you slowly start to put yourself a, a, a little timetable together and you slowly start to get used to it. And you say, okay, right, I can do this now. And I'll go to, I'll go to Tesco now. And now's the evening, I'll watch a film or whatever it is you do. And it was much the same, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I was just totally lost. I was bored. I didn't know what to do. This is prior to any internet or anything like that and obviously I wouldn't have it anyway if I would um, but then after a couple of weeks I slowly started to get myself together a timetable or it sort of t- well not a timetable it sound like school a routine of some sort a routine exactly I got myself together a routine right okay I'll sit here in the morning like it, I'd sit say for example at the tube station in the morning and then in the evening that's when the commuters would come through. And then I would go and walk around some of the prettier neighbourhoods, you know, because that was nice. Um, uh, I might go and sit in McDonald's for a while. Um, and, of course, sleeping is very regular. Right. Because we, when I, I was trying to sleep in a – at the beginning, at least, I was trying to sleep in a chilling cabinet. and It's very cold. Um, and then when I ended up back out on the street, uh, sleeping is not fits and starts. And um, I, so it wouldn't, sleeping, what I'm saying is sleeping doesn't necessarily come at night. Right, right. Is it almost sa- safer in a way to sleep during the day? Because at night, you know, you might have some some unsavory characters knocking about. And also, you know, one thing I found sad when I was researching your story is that you did have to deal with some hostility from from the public, didn't you? Drunk drunks in particular, you know, they sort of try and attack you. Could you could you just tell us a bit about that? Because that that sounds pretty pretty terrifying, really. Well, problems with the public didn't wasn't just that. I, I, I'll move on to that in a second. But you know, there's other problems with the public. I mean, people just just throw random abuse at you for no reason. And you, you know, like oh, you know, I used to, uh, for example, <clears throat> I used to shade under a tree if it was raining, um, and people used to just come by and shout, "No, no, no dogs allowed on the grass." God, stuff like that. Mm. Um, 
can anyone smell shit? Sorry, I don't know if you have a swearing thing. No, you can't. You can't swear. It's right. fine, yeah. Anyway, you know, uh, can anyone smell shit? You know, looking at you and stuff like that. But, yeah, that was the thing you're referring to. Um, that did happen. Um, I was trying to sleep on the bench at night in a park. Uh, and, well, I had no warning, but suddenly I was just leapt upon by some indiscriminate people. I mean, they could have been other homeless people, to be honest. I don't know who they were. But I know I had my eyes closed, you know, and I was trying to sleep. Uh, and I, the next thing I remember, I woke up in hospital. My God. Uh, I, I, lost, uh, I lost the tooth there. Yeah. Jesus. Um, but otherwise, I was just sort of battered and bruised. and uh, I, I escaped fairly lightly, but any belongings I had were gone. Um, and I was in hospital for uh, four nights. Yeah, it was quite, quite traumatic. And then after it happened, I couldn't go back to that. I used to hang out in that particular park quite a lot. Um, and after it happened, I, I couldn't go back there because I was sort of convinced that there were these people just going to jump out on me at, at any given moment. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, fall off a horse. They say you should drive, get right back on it. But uh, I, I didn't for a while. and. I couldn't go back there and I went to a different place to sleep. So, um, but it wasn't all bad, you know, I mean, I was going to say, um, so on that, that sounds absolutely terrifying and it's terrible how, how some people can be really, isn't it? But on the flip side of that, did you ever have any, you know, really nice experiences with people, people that would try and help you out, stop and talk? Um, yeah. If we could talk a bit about the good side of people after hearing that horrible story. There's lots of good sides, really. Um, well, there was, without you know explaining too much, but um, well, going into sort of shoe shining and stuff like that, um, I had I, I made a very good friend on the street uh, who was in the army, and he'd effectively been institutionalised into the army, much like I'd been institutionalised into acting. So we had that connection. Um, and um, he was, you know, he was a fantastic bloke, and uh, I, don't, I don't know um, much about him now. But um, there was also when I decided that my life, I wanted to live, if you like, you know, that my, if you like, my grieving process was over. When I decided that it happened, there was a very major event that happened that led me to that the realization um when i decided that i wanted to change and that i thought i wanted to live and that i wanted to be a normal person um it's funny how help comes you know it's sort of without necessarily even seeking it and there was an old man who used to run a, a shoe repair shop near where i uh used to at this tube station, near the tube station, and he taught me how to shoe shine. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he used to look after my when I was shoe shining, just wandering around and shoe shining on the streets. Uh, he used to look after my cash because obviously I couldn't keep my cash on me because it, it get mugged, you know, you get stolen. So you, you know, you don't think of these things, but. Uh, yeah, he looked after my stuff. Uh, uh, so there were, lot, there were lots of good people too, good people and bad people. Absolutely. Like with anything in life. Yeah. yeah exactly. and, the, and, and the major event where everything changes is where you meet this, um, this lovely guy who helps you with, with the shoe shining and, and stuff like that. And that then, wasn't a major thing that happened. Right. Okay. Yeah. If you, well, if we could talk about that, that major thing that, that you mentioned, because obviously that sounds pretty key to the story. Yeah, well, it is absolutely key to the story. It, it, it's it's the thing that the whole story hinges on, if you like. Um, the, the the guy I was referring to earlier, um, who I became friendly with, another homeless guy um, who was in the army. Um, we we used to uh, 
get food from the bins together. Um, and one time we were on a train platform and he ran in front of a train. My goodness. And I was sitting there and I just sort of, what? well, I didn't, obviously I didn't know he was going to do it. But the next thing I, I just, just, really just sort of ran out and I looked up and luckily the train had stopped, managed because it was pulling into the station. So it was slowing down anyway. And so luckily the train managed to jam on his brakes and stop about, I guess, two metres before his body. And he'd managed not to get electrocuted, which is good. And I talked him off the bench. And um, uh, I talked him off the bench. And we had a whole kind of big thing. And the suicide people turned up from British Transport Police. It was all a big, you know dreadful drama and um i that was the moment really uh, that was that was my moment that was that unlocked everything and i realized that life i can't take i don't want to take life for granted anymore and I, i want to live i don't want to i don't I don't want to, who am I? I don't want to be this person anymore. And I think I had a real moment where I, 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 yeah, yeah, I had a real moment where I I kind of really thought that, do you know what? I'm, I'm happy with not being an actor anymore. How did you go about putting this newfound realization or, or attitude in into practice? Because it's all very well, you know, thinking, right, I'm going to change. And there'll be people listening, going through other stuff that, you know, you might hit a point where you think you want to change, but putting it into practice is something very difficult. And especially in your situation when you're you're homeless, it's, um, you know, it's a difficult existence as is. So, so yeah, how did you put that newfound attitude, belief, feeling, yeah, into practice? I didn't sit down and make an action plan. No, I didn't sit down and make a plan, right, this is what I'm going to do. Um, but once I had once my, I had decided, that was the important thing, I decided that I didn't want this anymore. Okay, once I decided that, I then had this point which you're talking about, which is that you don't really know. So it's all very well knowing I don't want this anymore. Yeah. But how, what do I do? Yeah. How can I, how can I do? Anyway, I used to sit, um, I used to sit, I used to sit in regular positions around London and um, this um, passerby, uh, he said to me, I, he, I used to stop and give me money from time to time. And he said to me that he used to work in the city of London and that, uh, and that there are people, there's someone near his office who cleans shoes on the street. Uh, and, and, and he said, you know, that's something I could do, you know, because I mean, I was just sitting there all day long or walking around or whatever I was doing all day long. Um, how difficult could that be to do? So um, I didn't know anything about cleaning. I didn't know the first thing about how to clean a shoe or anything. Um, but something, something sparked off in me, you know? Something sparked off in me because I tell you, one of the reasons why something sparked in me was because the guy who, uh, uh, who jumped through himself in front of the train, who was in the army, he'd been talking to me about how he used to clean shoes in the army. And so when this guy just sort of said out of nowhere, oh, you know, shoot, it just all seemed to, oh, wow. You know, it seemed right. It just seemed right. And um, so I, 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 I went and I met this uh, cobbler who I was t- talking about earlier. He taught me how to, I bought my stuff from him and he taught me how to clean shoes. And then, and then I went off and just sort of, did it on the street wow wow how were the early days of of doing it how, how did it go did you did you always have enough enough business or were there some days where you couldn't find anyone how, how did how did it go 
I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was, you know, you know, to any of your listeners, you know, I was in Fulham. This is where a lot, the large part of this happened. It was in the Fulham area. And um, I didn't really know the first thing about how to try to find custom. And um, I sat in Fulham. There was no real, it was no real action, you know, there was no real business or anything like that. But um, eventually, one time a bloke came by and he said that he, he was, an, again, another person I used to talk to. And he said to me that people, uh, you know, why don't, he, he recommended that I go up into London, and do it. you know, the city of London where the finances are and everyone's really dressed up and all that sort of stuff. Uh, okay, give it a go. So. I went up to London and sat on the street corner in London around Cannon Street. Uh, and I was being chased up because it's illegal. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just sit up on street corners. Sure. Uh, you know, it's trading licenses, all those sorts of things. So um, I was being, and they have regular checks. You know, they have um, uh, people from the council walk around and if they hear stories about people trading without a license you know they send someone round and uh and um so i got caught one time and then every time after that it was it was a runaway it was just we're being chased about from pillar to post really uh not sustainable but again i had customers and they said you know one particular customer said why don't you come into my office and I'm, you know, there'd be good business in there because he knew of my problems. And he was like, why don't you come into my office and shine shoes in there? And mm. I was like, okay, all right. I couldn't really imagine it, but okay, if you say so. So I did that and everything just opened up. My goodness. So that was the real key moment when you went into that office. And then how quickly did did things pick up? Um, and did you find... You're, were you earning enough money at any point soon after that to, to get yourself a place to stay? How did things develop from there? Yeah, so um, I uh, I had, uh, I met a girl and who later became my wife. Wow. Yeah, I met a girl and she put me up on her floor um, and... Uh, I was sleeping in a small bed sit with her. She used to, she was Polish and she, she, sh she shared a double bed with her friend who was female as well. And she said to me, you know, do you want to come and sleep with me and my friend? I'm like, oh, God. what a result. Suddenly I'm, you know, shacking up with two girls and, um, and, uh, but yeah, so I went and slept on their floor and one thing led to another in that regard and we ended up as i say we ended up getting married um but um yeah uh, but so it's funny how you know i just going back to when i made that mental bridge between the old and the new and not wanting to be that person anymore it's amazing how these things come out of nowhere yeah, after speaking to quite a few people on this podcast, it's amazing what seems to happen when you put that positive energy out there and decide that you want to do something. Life just seems to, you know, return the favour in in some way, and it seems that seems true in your case. Could you talk to me about the the feeling when you first had, you know, a real place to stay and a roof over your head after after living on the streets, and how how long were you homeless for in in total? I was homeless. In and around, you know, give or take a week, I was homeless for about seven months. Um, when I first found somewhere, um, I was obviously very grateful. That goes without saying. Um, it felt, obviously, the stuff, it felt very good to have somewhere to go. And it felt nice to have a place, a roofer to call my own, even though I was on her floor. Yeah, yeah. It was like, it was a place, you know, I used to sit on the street and I used to watch people go home and I used to think those people, they're all going home to something. 
very yeah. difficult to explain, but they've all got a place. And I don't think we, we, we sort of realise how important that is to us, to have a place that's yours, you know, that's your little fiefdom, your little home. I, I don't think, I can't overemphasise that. And um, it just felt good to, 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 you know, I'd finished cleaning shoes all day and I could go home and I could go in this room and I could sit there and I didn't have to go and walk around cash converters and I didn't have to go and just sit in the park and stare at the birds anymore. I could go and just sit there. No, we didn't have a television or anything, but um, even so, you know, even so. Um, so it obviously was fantastic. Yeah, and these are, these are all things that we take for granted as people that have never been through that. You know, I've never been homeless. And so the the act for me of taking the train home or, or whatever it may be is just a, a given, but you don't stop to think there are people out there that, that don't have that simple, you know, that simple comfort. Um, and so how did things develop from there, Drew, in terms of, of the business? It sounds like things are starting to go your way. You've got a roof over your head. You've, you know, you've learned the, the, uh, the art of shoe shining, if, if you like. You've, you, you're in the city going into an office. If you could talk to us about, yeah, the, the growth from there. Well, that really, you know, what we're talking about there is the inception of Sunshine Shoe Shine, really. Um, I suppose in, in, in a very early sense it started on the bench but um once i was in the office i realized that you know here is here is some this is not just a means to an end here is a business but here is something you know there's a business here. this is not just sitting on the streets it, you know and being chased about from pillar to post here is a, here is a business yeah a legitimate business um and so I, as luck, blind luck should have it, it was something that I could do, you know, that I've, yeah, that I was, I was able to do, you know, my skill set was such that, you know, um, that was something I could do. And I found myself accumulating more and more of these offices to go to, more and more places, you know, I'd say to someone, in an office, oh, I need more places to go to clean shoes. Could you recommend anywhere? The cities I can, they talk about cities, an old boy network. Well, really, it's not old boys now, but it is a network. It was an old boy network. Now it's a network. And they would just phone around to their friends using their little intercom system that they all have connected. Uh, and they'll say, you know, we've got this great guy here, comes around, shine shoes. Do you want him to come around there? It's okay. And on you go and on you go and on you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's organic like yes. that in that regard. And I've never been backward in going forwards. Um, and so I, I, I start to accumulate all these offices. And then I eventually got to this point where I had too many offices to fill up Monday to Friday. But, you know, by this point, I'd accumulated maybe, you know, 13 offices, 14 offices. Wow. Yeah, which is quite a big deal. I mean, it doesn't it sound much, but it's quite a big deal because these companies are international financial institutions. This is not, you know, I don't mean to be demeaning, but this is not, you know, some bloke on his own, you know, business type thing. These, these are high-end, super, super conservative type businesses. And um, I, so, but they were sending me around there and I got like about 13 of them and I was like, wow, okay, this is fantastic. And then I've got more than I can do. So what am I, what am I, I I'm not going to take someone on then, you know, seemed to be the obvious thing to do. Um, and then that was my first brush with take uh, uh, employment and also people who have special needs. Yeah, because th this is another really important thing that I wanted to touch on is that your your business, Sunshine Shoe Shine, it it only hires uh, um, people that were homeless or people that are that are disadvantaged in in some way. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's right. Talk talk to me about that decision because I, I think it's an absolutely fantastic uh, thing to do. If only more more people did that. But yeah, talk to me about that decision to yeah to do that. Well, I never really, you know, in, in so when you got, when you've been through everything that I've been through, uh, it's very you never really leave it behind as such. You make peace with it. But you don't leave it behind. It's still part of you. It's still part of me now. Um, and when I, I reached that point, um, I thought to myself, well, um, I was, by that point, I was actually married to this girl. Yeah. I said to her, look, um, um, I'm going to need someone to, uh, take. And I said, well, I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, do you know what? I do remember the moment I was standing at the window, but it's not really the point. I, I don't, but I just, it just came to me. I just thought, well, why don't I just take someone? Because, you know, I have to be honest, shoe shining, it can be learned easily. It can be learned quickly. It's, it's, you know, it was part of the reason why it was so great for me is because I, I learned how to do it in a day and then I was off and all I needed was that. And so I knew that this was a task that someone, of limited skills or experience could do. Yeah. You know, I wasn't suddenly, you know, getting a, a special needs person and putting them in a space rocket and saying, navigate yeah. to the moon. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to take someone um, uh, who's special needs to do this job because I think this is something they could do. And, and I think it's not much, you know, they have very limited opportunities the homeless and uh, uh, special needs um it's something they could do and I'll, I'll give it a go so i took this guy who was working uh voluntarily at sainsbury's uh, collecting the um uh trolleys he was in the trolley park he was looking for a permanent job and i said he was special he had down syndrome and I said, you know, you come do some, you want a job? I work in the city. I dressed it up and I said, I work in the city. Like stocks and shares or something he was thinking. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I spoke to his parents and I was like, so you're like, you're, you're asking me to, he wants to come and work in a city? You do know he's unwell. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know. I had to kind of elaborate. Um, but it, it was a very dangerous move on my behalf because I knew nothing down sooner i knew nothing of people with special needs i didn't know if this guy was dangerous i didn't know anything it was a massive and risk yeah it was a massive risk and the companies the places where i was sending him you've got to remember that the places i was sending him these were global footsy companies with lawyers coming out of their ears yeah. and the best lawyers in the world if he'd have gone in there and gone bonkers with a shoehorn and, you know, started, you know, three musketeers or, you know, whatever. That would have been the end of it, yeah. I could have been in hot water personally as well, corporate, you know, responsible, um, what do they call it? Um, liability, you know, employer liability. Yeah, yeah. That sort of stuff. So it was a very, very risky move on my behalf, given that I had not, by this point, I was just sleeping. On, on this floor, um, and all I, that was really all I had. Yeah, absolutely. That's a key moment for you, there, isn't it? Because if you take someone on and it goes well, then you're gonna, you know, go to even get to an even better situation. But if not, you could. Who knows? You might have found yourself back on back on the streets again, or or whatever. So, but judging where you are today, I'm gonna assume that it, it went well. And um, yeah, how how did things go? And how were his sort of first weeks working for you? Uh, it was it was. It was interesting. Um, I learned a lot um, about coping with people, training people. Um, um, I learned a lot and I was very worried about the implications of what I was trying to do, as you would be. I didn't really want to go back to where I was. Yeah, yeah despite having now this girlfriend, um, it still felt like a huge risk. And um, 
But I was actually, I was very worried how these special needs and ex-homeless people would go down in this environment as well. And it, it turned out that quite all my fears that I had about it were totally misplaced. And that the people where I was sending them, they absolutely loved it. You know, they absolutely loved it until something goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. You know, they yeah. absolutely loved the idea. Do you think this has been a contributing factor to to your success that, you know, your value of, of hiring, um, you know, be it people that were homeless or people that, were, that are disadvantaged in some way, do you think that's a value that people are really happy to to get behind and it's such a good thing that you do that that's actually helped grow the, the business even more? Yeah. A hundred, hundred percent, yes. But it's gone from it's being a, it's gone from being something that was a, a huge risk. It has huge upsides and huge downsides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has huge upsides and huge downsides. It's quite an ex, an extreme type of business, yeah. but it's the sort of thing I'm interested in. I'm not interested in going in the middle bit. I'm interested in that because it's living. And I made up my mind, I wanted to live. I wanted to, it's living. So um, it, has huge, it has huge downsides, obviously. I could say to you, if they suddenly go bonkers with a shoehorn or just, you know, I get phone, call, I get phone calls from them in tears and forgotten how to open a tin of shoe polish. You know, that sort of thing. So yeah, so the rea the reality of it is sometimes it is difficult, but that's the a decision that that you make, you know, when you when you decided to do that. But it's such a heartwarming story, really, that you know, and it just goes to show when you decide to do good things in life, you know, li life has a funny way of returning the favor. Kind of like what we were saying before, when you choose to try and you know tackle something with with a positive attitude. So it's a really really heartwarming uh, story, Drew. And could you give us a bit of um, an idea of of how how, how the company is today in in the here and now how many years has it been going and um yeah are things on the way up how's it uh, how is the the lay of the land as it were now i mean i've already mentioned lockdown obviously that hasn't gone down well uh so you know but to put that to one side um I, uh it's as, it's as successful and healthy as it ever has been ever um and uh, it's in part because I've learned a lot about, because I'm not trained in business and I don't, but I, I've just learned. And um, uh, so it, it's as healthy as it's ever been. It's, it's got, there's uh, eight people who are varying uh, problems difficulties who are uh, working at Sunshine now. And um, our companies, I mean, without trying to sound, you know, braggadocious, but our companies make up uh, some of the, say, you know, 50% of 30 of the biggest companies in Britain and the world are our clients, you know, so huge huge clients uh, and also small ones too um, and it's going very well and it, it, it's you know it uh, it keeps me interested yeah yeah and um, I just can't wait to go back and do it again after all this you know I'm sitting around at home all the time. And another thing that I wanted to talk about, Drew, which um, it, again is in, incredibly uh, admirable, is you actually give a portion of your your profits to charity, don't you? So I, at least I read that in in the newspaper. If you if you could talk to me again about about making that decision, right? So that is what we what we have is it, it's we we'll call it the charitable donation scheme. So it's kind of got conflated with the idea that I, I've. Uh, any money I make, I give it all away. You yeah. know, I'm not Jesus. Yeah. I'm not giving, you know. But uh, so what we have is a thing called uh, Sunshine Charitable Donation Scheme, which enables um, 
uh, so companies when they take us on, not only do they have the not only do they have the um, benefits of taking on someone who's very uh, different from their staff, um, and that's called employee engagement stuff in 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 corporate terms. It's called employee engagement. Um, engaging your employees with good acts and getting yeah. them involved in good acts. So having their shoes cleaned is, is a good act and they get the shoes cleaned. So it's win-win. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's the, when the, when the companies start with Sunshine, we have a thing called this charitable donation scheme which uh, not only it allows them to donate part of their the profit that any profit we make from their service that they pay for, um, we will donate back to a charity of their choice, and uh, they can choose what that is, and they can change it from year to year. So you know. Because these uh, large companies, they, they choose a charity, say cancer research, and then after a year they review it and yeah. say, okay, this year Oxfam. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and so they can move that in, a line with, in an alignment with what their year-to-year corporate and social responsibility uh, things are. So it's something they can choose to do if they wish, but they don't have to. Obviously, they don't have to. But... Uh, uh, it's something that they can choose to do if they wish. Sure, sure. Well, overall, Drew, I have to say, I think what you're doing is is in, is incredible, especially coming from the place that you know that that you were in. And um, one thing I'm curious about are you are you proud of your achievements? Are you proud of what you've created? Is there a sense of fulfilment there? Yes. Yeah. I, of course. Yes. Yes. Of course, I am. Of course, I am. Uh, I. I have to say that, you know, sometimes possibly to the detriment of the business that what I mean is in the sense that I have a very, very strong uh, um, father instinct for the business and the people who work for the business. Um, And if you like to call that ego or being proud or whatever, then, yeah. Because um, I, I do end up being a father figure for a lot of the people who work at Sunshine. Um, I've been best man at wedding and wow. you know, all sorts of things. Yeah, and exactly. um, so in that sense, you know, yes, I am proud. And, you know, sometimes possibly I haven't taken the business down certain avenues that maybe it should have gone because I'm so attached to it. You know, I'm so proud of it that I I want to call every, I want to control the entire thing myself. And I'm quite it sounds <laughs> dreadful, but I'm quite a controlling person. I like to and um uh yeah, I, I possibly should have taken it down certain ways, but then I didn't because of I just felt like I, I couldn't if I did I'll lose some semblance of making the decisions that I do make. And, you know, um, I want, I still want to be the guy who they call up and say, I can't open the tin of polish. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding you. It's not something I like, but that I want to be that person. Yeah. You want to hold on to your values and, and your reasons why and, and, and all the yeah. rest of it. And I think that's yeah. inc- that's incredibly admirable. And if sometimes that gets in the way of the business growing to a next level, but yeah. that's something that you accept. As I said, that that's that's something that I have to, you know, and everyone I'm sure has a lot of respect for, you know, because... When you think about just on a day-to-day level, take, for example, a teacher and they're a brilliant teacher, but then they get to the point where they're such a good teacher, they start getting promoted and doing less and less work that's actually teaching. They end up doing less and less work what they actually love doing and end up sitting behind a desk. Um, and that's just not something that I really, I want to, you know, focus on the things that I want to do and not, and, and, and 
not the other things. I think we'd all say that, but I'm pretty headstrong on that. Absolutely. Well, I, I think personally what you've created, Drew, is um is an inspiration and it's a really it's a really heartwarming story sat here listening to it. Um, Thank you know, you. I really really <clears throat> genuinely and honestly have really enjoyed talking about it and, and getting to know getting to know about um your your story. And one way that I like to finish off the the podcast, Drew, is by asking guests to give listeners a couple of bits of advice um if they're going through a similar situation. But they don't they also don't have to be going through a similar situation. It could also just be people going through adversity in general um you know and i think there's a lot of that going on at the moment with uh with the with the way the world is so you know drawing on your own experiences drew are there are there any bits of advice that you'd like to give to listeners first thing i'd say is follow sunshine shoe shine on facebook <laughs> <laughs> so you had to get the plug in yeah. <laughs> you don't plug. yes uh, yeah as luck should have it you know, I'm in the process of putting this all into a book. And my last chapter is uh, a kind of, um, it's a uh, marks on uh, tips for management and life, if you like. Um, so I have got things down uh, in that regard. Um, and a lot of the things that I have, a lot of the things that I have approached in the tips are more to do with uh, a sort of more holistic uh, sense of um, how to live your life and be happy type of scenario rather than practical. It's, difficult, it's very difficult to give practical advice because everyone's mm -hmm. situation is so different. Because if I hadn't been sitting in that park at that time, that guy would have never said to me, shoe shining is something you can do. And, so on and so on and so on and so on. You know, and today I could be a Formula One racing driver instead. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's very difficult to give practical advice. And I think a lot of people who come across difficulties, often the problems are not the practical ones. They're more in your mind. They're the problems you have in your mind. And they are the problems that have caused, usually, or well, certainly did in my case, they were the problems that caused me to get into the situation I was in. And I think that's quite common. The homelessness starts in the mind and works its way out till you're eventually you are homeless. Uh, it starts with a lack of caring for yourself, a lack of all those important factors. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that if you're, if you're, if you've made that decision, if you made that, that um, decision that you no longer, you, you, you're, you feel like, like you're getting down and you feel like, uh, you feel like there maybe there's more to life than sitting in your room in lockdown. Or if you feel that, you know, you're not looking forward to going back to work when you are going back. So where is, where, where is that all going to, where's that all going to fit in? Um, I'd say that, you, 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 you have to approach the subject in a way that there's no point being down on yourself because you're in that position, for one. There's no point being down on yourself. In that position. That's not going to help you. Certainly didn't help me. And it's not going to help you to be in that position. There's no, it's not going to help you to go and sleep on the street. It didn't help me get over it. In fact, it made things a whole lot worse to go and sleep on the street. Um, so being down and, and stuff like that is, I think it, if you can try to think about yourself objectively, think about your life objectively, don't get, don't get caught in that under that, that horrible undercurrent that we've all had at some point, which is self pity and, and depression and all those things down there that lurk in our human psyches. Don't get, bog down into them try to keep yourself above it and try to distract yourself with okay this is the situation what can i do this is what i'm good at this is what i'm not good at this is what i like doing this is what i don't like doing um anything you can give yourself to try to to try and move away from those thoughts um 
is a good thing. And so I would encourage anyone to really think about themselves. And I don't mean that in a I don't mean that in a self-pity way. Mm. I mean to really think about what you can do, what you can't do, how you could how these things and suddenly things that seem to have no when it suddenly it goes from seeing like there's no hope, you're thinking about the things that could potentially give you hope. And it just, you know, it, it turns that dial from the possible to the, from, sorry, from the impossible to the possible. And what you can do, and then once you ascertain what you can do and move forward and how you can uh, feel better, once you move that dial, you will find, like, in my case, as I'm a firm believer, and, and I know you are too because you mentioned it, I'm a firm believer in a serendipity. I know that sounds like a, a, a fuzzy in the air, mm. oh, he's, you know, go and live in San Francisco and be a hippie type yeah. thing, but <laughs> it's, I'm a firm believer in it. And uh, once you turn the dial and move into, into that mindset, of what you can do rather than what you can't. Like a lot of the people who work for me, they could sit around and, you know, oh, I'm busy. I was homeless or oh, I've got Down syndrome or oh, I've got learning, diff- or whatever it is, but they know what they can do and they can do shoe shining. They yeah. can do that. And they're an inspiration to me because they show that you don't have to have you don't have to be a boffin and working in neuroscience in Cambridge to lead a happy life. You just need to be able to do something and do it with your heart and do it well. And those people, if once you can turn that dial and move from what you can do rather than what you can't do, things like shoe shining jobs, whatever it is that you're, you, you, you can do or are passionate about, Things have a habit of just coming along. You know, people walk through parks. Cobblers have shops that sell things. Um, and I'm not trying to over-romanticise the world because I know the world. I've been both sides. I know the world. But these things do turn up. And when they do, you'll be there to take them and you'll have your eyes open to see them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's, um, I think there's some really, really interesting bits that, that you mentioned there, Drew. And that's, that's something that I think we're, it's, it's so easy to be, to be guilty of, to focus on things that you can't do rather than you can. I think partly because of the sort of culture we live in now and everyone compares themselves to, to everyone else. And it's quite easy to get down about your own abilities in some way. But if you can try and put that to one side and as you say, focus on, well, what can I do? What what am I good at? What would I like to do? What What is my why? What is going to keep me going? Once you can find those things and um, and try to approach them in a positive way, which is you know easier said than done, um, as in your case, things have a funny way of falling into place. Um, and it, you know, I, a saying that I really like is what what a difference a day can make because you can be in you know you, in your case you can have seven months of of homelessness and all it takes is to meet one person or one conversation and and things can the tide can turn and it can go your way. Um, so yeah, Drew, I just want to say, um, above all, thank you very much for, for coming on the podcast. I've really, really enjoyed listening to your story. Um, all of the links to, um, the sun, sunshine, sh- shoe shine. God, I can't say, I can't say it's like a tongue twister. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Yeah, it's shut up, shut up. Uh, sunshine, shoe shine. Uh, all of the links will be, uh, in the description. So make sure you go and follow, like, uh, and all the rest of it and support what Drew's trying to do because, you know, it's, um, it's a really, it's, it's really good what you're doing. And, uh, I think people should get behind it. So yeah, above all, thanks for taking the time, Drew. And I really appreciate it. That's all right. It's a pleasure. That's it for today's episode, guys. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more, make sure you hit subscribe. And above all, thanks a lot for watching. If you've got a story you want to share on the Back on Track podcast, get in touch, give me a shout. I'd love to hear from you via info at backontrackpodcast.com.